Okay. Okay. Now let's get cracking then because we're three minutes into the webinar, four minutes now. I'm going to share my screen and let's do a little bit of housekeeping, a little bit of announcements before we get straight into the content. Does that sound okay with you, Simon? Good to meet. This is okay with my colleague Carla at Container Solutions. It's great. Go for it. Then at that point, let's get moving. I'll try to share my actual screen and not some sort of spreadsheet that exposes the whole inner workings of our company. So, big favor, can people in the background go on mute? I'm excited to have you in person in Bonn. Um, oh, oh, mute yourself, oh, sales call, sales call. <laughs> Let's talk about processes. Um, uh, yeah, okay, the guy on the sales call. I'm not trying to mute the person. <laughs> Let's go mute them. <laughs> Please, la la la, we're not listening. We realize this is probably a private call. Confidential. <laughs> okay, okay, welcome back. I don't know how many people are on the call. It's really oh, right. he's still there. Hang on. I think he's giving sales prices. In the social network for he's muted us, but not muted himself. He got the wrong way around. I think I muted him. Oh, okay. I found well him. Okay, so <laughs> never mind. These things do happen on webinars, so we're not going to pick on, on that gentleman. These things do of happen. Of course not. Uh, absolutely. And also, my young boy might run in. He might give a call. Amazon might deliver. I might vape. Uh, you're in my home, same as I'm in your home. Everything else. So you can vape. You'll need it when you see my talk. Okay, right. Go right. For we it. really need to get started now. We're now five minutes into this. Okay, so first of all, welcome back, everybody. Um, it's nice to see some new faces. It's nice to see some old faces. Many of you know, over the summer, we've been talking about strategy, cloud productive. Hello? Yeah, there's you, Mo. Can I use another bank? Cool. <laughs> okay, we may mute yourself. Mute we may I can do it. I'm muting everybody. I'm trying to fix this. <laughs> Okay, we've been talking about strategy. I've been on Twitter sharing ideas with some of my uh, old friends from the Agile community. I'm really grateful for that. And based on the back of the last meeting, we talked about serverless DevOps, and then we had a sort of off-the-cuff idea uh, to do one of Simon's sort of sort of trademark uh, talks or discussions, which is how DevOps is the new legacy. That's what we're going to be getting into today. Now, before we do that, just a couple of announcements. In about four weeks' time, this is my probably my life's work. I don't know if it's any good, but I will be talking about resilient leadership, including examples from history, etc., etc. Carla's going to chuck a link in the chat box now. Also, we are running a theme, actually, a never-ending theme, called What the Fuck is Cloud Native? Because nobody actually knows. Uh, this content's awesome. It includes people like Simon coming in to contribute, Sam Newman, all of our friends from the community. Stick your email in if you want to subscribe or just don't. Just follow us on Twitter and drop into the blog whenever you feel like it. But we have dedicated ourselves to answering this question definitively. And that's coming up very soon. Software Circus, totally free. You'd not get tracked or dropped cookies on your laptop. It's our gift to the community. Come along to that. It's going to be awesome. If anybody wants to uh, propose a talk, we're listening. This is a community event. All the vendors can kind of, we keep them at arm's length. This is about real people solving real problems and it's gonna be on Halloween. Woohoo! Um, and of course, you can win a copy of this book. Carla, how can they win a copy of this book? Well, we're gonna uh, randomly select winners uh, from uh, the attendees of this webinar and they, they will be notified uh, around two hours after, after this call. Okay, fine. So we've got a raffle. You might win it. You can, you can download an Excel on the website. That's the best bit. Don't tell O'Reilly. Okay, good. Uh, fine. Okay, a little bit of housekeeping. Please do say hello, specifically if you've got some things that you're working on. If you've got a specific question you think we can help in the debate and the discussion section at the end, do so. Stick your cameras on. Uh, we're trying to recreate a nice atmosphere. You don't have to if you don't want to. We have a code of conduct. Don't breach it. You can read the version there. We are going to be recording this webinar. In fact, it should be recording now. Just be aware, uh, if you have an issue with that, then probably let us know. I don't think we're going to stop recording. You should probably leave at that point. All materials will be shared. Don't worry. It's all coming to you um, in an email. And if you, if you don't see the email, it's all on LinkedIn and, and Twitter. The video, the deck, the deck from Simon, et cetera, et cetera. Take a breath and next slide. So what are we going to be doing? Yeah, of course, we're going to be talking about how a good movement, whether it's DevOps, Agile, uh, whatever Simon mentioned earlier. ITIL, what did you mention, Simon? 
Oh, okay, I'm off mute. So, you know, ITIL, uh, DevOps, uh, now we've got serverless. Uh, serverless is, of course, the new set of practices, uh, which we don't really have a flag around, a meme yet. Uh, people talk about FinOps, FinDev, you know, something will cement, and that'll be the, 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 the new faction going forward. I'll go through how these factions work. It, it, it's, al it's always quite fascinating. Good, good. So my, so my talk at the beginning is about really how all movements become a racket, and I was a very, and I'm a very proud member of the Agile community, especially the extreme programmers that I felt really launched, helped launch my career Whoa, a long time ago now. So, I, but nevertheless, the Agile movement followed these, these steps to becoming a racket. And I want to talk about that today, which will lead nicely into Simon's talk, which is really the main event, if you will, which is how DevOps has become the new legacy. So, how, so it's really interesting because uh, obviously Ken Beck's a friend and uh, extreme programming, absolutely fantastic. Um, what I don't do in this talk today is go through social practice theory, but the issue is, is we constantly try to create one size fits all methods. And so when you are looking at a space, actually extreme programming in certain contexts works well, lean in others, uh, Six Sigma in others, and you've got to use all three. Uh, but what we are seeing, and it's slightly different from the practices you get with DevOps and serverless and ITIL, uh, what we are seeing in that project management space is the attempt to once again create the all-encompassing method and and so people bolt on to agile all this stuff they don't need and then what happens is when you use it it doesn't quite work and people say you use the wrong bit of the process and at that point it's become a racket and, and basically agile is now becoming you know process over people which is hilarious for something which was people over process but anyway yes exactly so i will feed directly into i will prime simon's talk so that when he begins you'll understand a few of the underlying concepts and at the very end, we have quite a large amount of time for debate and discussion. So the last time we won a webinar together, we had some really good questions, really good debate. And really, that's what we're hoping to do today, to stimulate uh, the, the intellect. If we can solve any real problems you're having at work right now, awesome. This is, this is the best outcome. And then we'll see, we'll see what happens after that. So therefore, without any further ado, this is my talk and my section of the webinar, how all movements become a racket. And specifically, the three things I want to talk about are the cargo cults of Melanesia, uh, something that I learned about actually about 15 years ago. And once we understand the human nature, the psyche, we need to unpack how the actual fuck does this happen? How do people, so-called secular, rational and intelligent people, basically us, how do we make the same mistakes as the tribes people and the tribal leaders of the islands of Melanesia? And you'll see that there's not much difference between, uh, in fact, there is no difference between people who live in Melanesia and people who live in London. Now that we know about this psyche, we need to defend ourselves against it, defend ourselves against our magical thinking and against those who would exploit it. And that's the third part of the talk, defences against these dark arts. So for those of you who don't know, and it's, don't worry if you don't, I mean, I had to look this up as well, Melanesia is a range of islands, it's an area of the Pacific Islands that spans uh, Fiji uh, in the east all the way to Papua New Guinea uh, on the west, uh, encompassing the Bismarcks, the Solomons, Vanuatu, etc, uh, etc. Et the political and social organisation of some of the islands is based around the idea of the big man. The big man is charismatic, persuasive, solves conflicts, but very importantly, facilitate reciprocal gift giving um, it's not a formal position you don't get elected to be, become the big man and there's always a few emerging big men ready to take your place should you fail in your essential duty of facilitating gift giving um, and then once you've once you can no longer fulfill your role as a big man you actually become a rubbish man so the islands of melanesia first came into contact with travelers well, actually, it would have been the 18th century, then the 19th century, and then had a very, very strong meeting of cultures in the 20th century when the Americans were using um, the, the Melanesian islands uh, as bases to wage their war against the Japanese in the Pacific theatre. Now, when this so-called technologically superior culture, the Americans, came into contact with the so-called technologically inferior cultures of Melanesia, there was a clash and a tension. Many of the Melanesians had never seen these goods, right? Uh, what to them seemed like an infinite supply, jeeps, 
tanks, guns, foodstuffs, no doubt tons and tons of beer. Um, and they assumed that these gifts, these material uh, products were from the gods, gifts from the gods. And if they could copy the rituals and the symbols of the Americans, they too could bring forth these goods. The type of culture that believes this, that believes in copying rituals and symbols to bring forth gifts from the gods is known as a cargo cult. Here are some examples. Uh, the island of Tanna, num uh, soldiers arranged in a, in a squad, parading up and down an imaginary, imaginary uh, parade ground with guns fashioned from bamboo slung over their left shoulders. They'd obviously copied this from the GIs that they'd observed uh, in the Second World War. An example of a symbol, this, in this case a satellite receiver fashioned from hay uh, and woods, uh, classic ritual copying or classic symbol copying, uh, needless to say this doesn't work. Um, the American flag fashioned from sticks uh, uh, and rope along the, the outer edges. And in fact, on many of the islands, whole airports were recreated. Uh, Aeroplanes, air traffic control uh, towers, headphones fashioned from coconuts, which went, you know, a half of the coconut would go on one ear and the other half would go on another. And actually even landing lights, uh, sticks pierced down the runway, all uh, uh, yeah, set alight so that the, the plane could actually come and land. Obviously, none of these technologies worked and the gifts didn't come from the gods because that is just not how, uh, how this stuff worked. So, of course, what happened is the pressure on the big men to, to reciprocate, uh, to, to fac facilitate this reciprocal gift giving had led to this, what's, you know, quite peculiar behaviour, uh, you know, as we see it. But actually, this is where it gets interesting. We all do this. And um, I first learned about cargo cults from Dave Thomas, I think in 2006, I think. Uh, and it was at the Conference for the Advancement of the Software Profession in London. And Dave was doing a keynote. And after the keynote, we all, of course, got to the bar and, and had our dinners that evening because SPA was a weird conference. You used to stay in the conference center, which was, <laughs> was really cool. You do the conference in the daytime and then spill out into these rooms and then you'd all meet again uh, at dinner and over drinks. And we were given examples, and my two examples were this. Um, a big man, I worked for a large consultancy about that time, and one of our big men had gone off to a, a conference and learned about test-driven development and unit tests and things like this. Came back from the conference and said, we're doing this, right? It leads to increased software quality, better flexibility, yada, yada, yada. So off they went, and, and of course the big man had said, we want 100% test coverage. So off, off the team went. Uh, and they got the 100% test coverage and had beautiful dashboards. Brilliant. The people deploying the software didn't see an increase in software quality. They were still capturing the same old bugs. Um, the, the software wasn't particularly more flexible. The time to turn around features was no quicker. So it looked like they'd failed on that measure as well. And then somebody with a bit more experience took a look at those tests and the consultants had not put a single assertion in the tests. They couldn't fail. So what had happened here, the big man, let's say from a culturally inferior, uh, a technologically inferior culture, had met people vastly superior to them in their understanding of software development, basically the extreme programmers. They'd taken away the rituals, test driven development, and the symbols, the dashboard and J unit, and of course have not uh, created the same effect. So we do this as well. Another classic example from the same company, somebody went to a conference and saw, saw a demonstration of Java, came back and said, well, we're all Java programmers now because we can do, we can do code reuse. Uh, one of the key mechanisms of code reuse is to, you know, uh, one, object, one class can inherit from another. And then if you pass any member of that class hierarchy to a method, the method will still work. It's the substitution principle. Well, this team of C programmers didn't really know what Java was, so they made every method static which made it was, meant it was impossible to override them. So they killed the language, they made, it, they made their own version of C, uh, but with a much bigger memory footprint and much worse performance. They did not get the same effects as the people at the conference had said that they would. Now, okay, fine, jump forward um, nine years, 2015, we start container solutions. And we start to meet people. We started in the Netherlands, I'm in London now, and uh, 
the companies we met had given up on Agile, given up on DevOps and said, now we're going to be cloud native. And they went and saw my friend, Adrian Cockcroft and, Ad and Simon's friend as well. And Adrian gives these great talks about chaos engineering, virtual machines, uh, in unlimited holidays because we're all adults at Netflix. And then people would rush back and say, right, we're going to be the Netflix of the Netherlands. We're going to do chaos. We're going to have unlimited holiday budgets. Boom. And it's like, oh my God, history repeats itself first as tragedy, then as farce. Uh, because you can't copy the symbols and the rituals of Netflix. Well, firstly, because you're a fucking bank and they stream videos. But secondly, <laughs> because it's, that's not what makes Netflix succeed. Chaos engineering is an output of a creative and dedicated team. It's not an input to it. That's what the extreme programmers taught us. It wasn't that test driven development and continuous integration drove software quality. You know, a team that was obsessed with uh, incremental improvements had come up with these great practices. And a snapshot in time of them would have been the XP practices, many of which are still very, very, very useful. So we see this all the time. So we cannot, we cannot take a superior position to people from uh, the second and third world for their stupid use of technology because we do it as well, right? What the actual fuck is going on here? This question uh, needs to be uh, answered. And I'm going to use myself as an example because I don't want to appear superior either. Um, oh, sorry, I got one slide ahead of myself. What the actual fuck? So I took this quote from Tim Wu. Tim Wu is the um, author of a book called The Attention Merchants. He also invented the term net neutrality. He's an American uh, advocate lawyer. And he said in the book, you know, for all of our secular rationalism and advances, the potential surrender for the charms of magical thinking lives in every human, lives in our psyche, awaiting only the advertiser or a conference speaker to awaken it. This is part of what we do. I'm so easy to lie to. If some conman comes up to me in the street and says, have you got 10 pounds because I've, I've, I've lost my wallet? I'm like, oh yeah, sure, let, let me help you. It's in us. It's, it's in us to see the best in other people and it's in us to be prone to magical thinking and solutions. So how does this happen? It starts with an intellectual gap. So when somebody technologically inferior meets somebody superior, there's a gap. When we started Container Solutions, I was that inferior person. Not around technology, I'm okay with that. Around sales and marketing and branding. I knew nothing. So I fell for everything. So I was the big man making these idiotic mistakes, reading a book and coming back and saying to Penny and Frank and Tice, hey, we're going to do this now. And then six months later thinking, oh my God, what have I done? Because we only had a little bit of money and now we've got none. So I also fell for this. So it starts with this intellectual gap, knowing you've got it, right? If you know you've got it, actually, that's half the battle. Now, from this weak understanding of technology, its promises and how to use it, comes desperation. So going back to the Netherlands, uh, ING Bank, it's smashing it, really good. Of high automation, nice culture, uh, a lot of DevOps practice and principles are doing well with cloud native and their digital products show that. Fantastic online banking, uh, fantastic tablet applications, et cetera, et cetera. All of the other banks in the Netherlands know this. So, so the bosses are saying, hey, ABN is saying, why can't we do that? SNS is saying, why can't we do that? At the same time, in our organizations, I'm just going to talk about that. It's lovely to hear the pitter patter of children's feet. I think they're gone now. The other pressure is our people. Our people see cloud native and DevOps and say, well, they're doing it. Why can't we? This, this gives a dual pressure to the big men or the big women who run our organizations. And it's exactly this pressure that primes us for wishful and magical thinking and thus opens the door to all the admin, the vendors, the grifters that will tap straight into that weakness and that desperation. The vendors specifically love this. They stoke, stoke your fears and then offer themselves as translators and soothsayers because who knows what a container is or a virtual machine? What executive would know that? So they say, oh, this is terrible. They stoke your fears then act as translators and then conveniently provide the elixir here by this product. Um, their business model is based on this, is based on fear and tapping into this. If any of my, my colleagues 
from the vendor community on the call, I'm sorry, but you know it and I know it too. Um, so an example of this, a concrete example, and again, I need to thank Dave Thomas. So I read, uh, he shared his deck with me from 2006 and that led me to watch a video from 2015. Dave gives this great example from Agile, the biggest racket of them all, some would say. Uh, and it's a good talk, you, you should watch it. But basically the, the rough, you know, one of the takeaways is this, Agile is an objective. You can have an Agile cat, an Agile person, an Agile method. This is hard to sell, hard to sell a process. How to, how to sell a way of thinking, which is what we do at CS. We, we talk about cloud native as a process. You don't need to buy that from us. You can, you can read that on Wikipedia. Um, so as an objective, it's hard to do something commercial with. So what happened is Agile was changed into a proper noun. It was capitalized exactly in the same way we capitalized God. And then we could ask things like, what is Agile? How to do Agile? How to fix your broken Agile? So the shysters went as far as changing the meaning of a word uh, just to sell us something that we didn't need. This was heartbreaking for me. This was, this was a particularly heartbreaking moment in my career, in my life, to meet the extreme programmers. To I felt I personally contributed to uh, embedding many of the ideas, for example, in Holland, where I lived, test-driven development, object dominant programming, certainly continuous integration, and then to watch it just be destroyed and evaporate into, you know, this, this was where I, this was, a, this was a moment when I grew up, when I realized software development was more about configuration and exactly the moment when I say most good ideas are completely bastardized by people who don't know what they're doing. And in the end, Container Solutions embeds the values of the Agile community, except we just extend it for cloud. So this was personally very difficult for me because I was only in my twenties. Um, and this is what happens, and Dave tells that story, so you should definitely watch that as a follow-up to this talk. And of course, the Eric Hoffer quote, and a thank you to Steve Freeman uh, on Twitter for this, every great cause becomes a movement, becomes a business, and eventually de degenerates into a racket. We have to arm ourselves against this. So first of all, know it's a scam, and then know that you're human. Um, a quick check checklist for the executives on the call to avoid doing the stupid things I did at CS. Are you insecure? Very difficult question to answer uh, if your ego is not in check. So you need to be a bit humble to answer um, this question properly. Because if you're feeling insecure, uh, if you're in awe of another person, if you're hero worshipping, it's a sign that you probably are insecure. Uh, this means you're ripe, you're primed for magical thinking. Do your ambitions outweigh your understanding? This is me, circa 2015. Huge ambitions to succeed. No idea what I was doing. Fucking none. Zero. Completely primed for magical thinking. Am I drawing a blank? If you ask me about rugby league, my mind explodes into a web of memories and opinions. If you ask me about a technology I don't understand, I draw a blank. If you're drawing a blank, you're primed for magical thinking. Are you moving quickly? Because only fools rush in. And honestly, are you about to buy coconut headphones? If you can answer these questions, you probably start to defend yourself against magical thinking and against people who would exploit that. Go slowly, stepwise. Speak to people who you trust. Uh, investors talk about an ax. If two investors meet over coffee and one investor gives another investor a tip, that investor will ask them, do you have an ax? Meaning, do you have an axe to grind? Will you have an upside to this transaction? Have you got a horse in the race? Don't speak to people with an axe. Don't speak to vendors. Don't speak to consultancies either. Uh, speak to people who you trust to have done this before. Stack the odds in your favor by experimentation and do not go down a path from which you cannot retreat. If you buy a load of software, two things are gonna happen feeling guilty and ashamed, you'll spend three years trying to get the most out of it, throwing good money after bad, or you'll put it on the shelf where it'll collect dust, but you've wasted your money. Both of these paths are difficult to come back from. Shelving a bad product is the most courageous thing to do because you're saying, I've just wasted a quarter of a million on that, but that's not right for us. So try to build a path from which you can retreat. And that is more or less my take on cargo cults of Melanesia, the structure, the psychological processes that lead to magical thinking, 
and some tips as to how to avoid it. We are all prone to wishful thinking. The quicker you realize that, the easier your life will become. I've lived two lives, the one before I knew this and the one after I knew this. Uh, we are all prone to advertisers, soothsayers and translators. Importantly, move in steps and don't speak to people uh, if they've got an ax. Speak to people you trust and have no gain in a transaction that you might make. And on that note, I think, let me check the time. This is the perfect time for any questions pertaining just to this talk, any comments, and if there are not too many, we can then slowly shift over to Simon's talk about uh, DevOps being the new legacy. There you go, Simon, what do you think? I gotta say, I loved it. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. And uh, I forget, you know, I had another talk prepared, but, but forget about that. I'm going to uh, share something else just to give you a bit of backup on this talk. Um, da -da -da, screen. Two. Are you now writing your? Are you now writing your presentation in real time? Uh, yeah, uh, too late. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, just to, just to re-emphasize something, I forget the presentation. That carefully crafted presentation. That's straight out the window. We might get back to it. So you know, when I'm looking at maps, uh, one of the things I talk about are basic patterns. And so as things evolve, they become more efficient, and they enable us to create new higher order systems, which are on the left hand side. So electricity, say at the bottom, goes from product to utility. Tesla and Westinghouse enabling things like I don't know, radio, television, computing. So the speed at which we can develop these things increases. They create new sources of value and worth, and they evolve. Now, it doesn't matter whether it's money, computing, penicillin, everything evolves from left to right uh, due to supply and demand competition. So on the left, it's chaotic, uncharted, and we're uncertain. You know, we've got this thing, penicillin, we don't know what it does. Eventually, it becomes industrialized, ordered, standard, Dalton dial, boring, you know, repeated, uh, generic. Okay, now because of this, what I learned back in 2005 uh, was there's no such thing as one-size-fits-all methods. Um, because they're polar extremes and there's a difference in the middle as well. Uh, don't get me started on bimodal. I, I, I attempted to do that in 2004, eight years before Gartner came up with the term. It's idiotic, uh, but that's another conversation for another day. Um, what we did learn was extreme programming, agile, if people want to use that as a noun, uh, was good on the left hand side because it was good at reducing the cost of change. That's what it's all about. In the middle, it took us ages because uh, we came up with all these sorts of ideas. Eventually, that's become more lean in the middle, uh, good at reducing uh, waste and learning. Right hand side, Six Sigma. Everybody goes, oh, Six Sigma. That is brilliant for reducing deviation. Okay? Um, so one's on differentiation of functionality, one's on learning, one's on differentiation of operation. So I'll give you an example, uh, which is going to be, uh, well, the first problem is if you ever go to a conference and say that, you'll get this, burn him heretic. I mean, every time I go to a Six Sigma conference and say, Six Sigma doesn't apply everywhere, burn him heretic. I go to Agile conferences, it doesn't apply everywhere, Agile ex is extreme programming, burn him heretic. I mean, it's the classic way of getting everybody against you is to say you're all right and all wrong. So I'll give you an example. Uh, which is HS2, high speed rail. I love using this example uh, because this is the one bit of HS2 which has really worked well, uh, which was run by James Finley, the CIO, and it was building HS2 in a virtual world. So they started off with a, a systems uh, map. Well, it's not a map, it's actually a graph. Uh, these are the different components with links between them. James's problem is which bits do I outsource, which bits do I build in-house, how should I do this? There's over 300 million permutations of that question, so how on earth would you know? So he spent uh, an afternoon, Sunday, had a cup of tea, drew a map, uh, and uh, these are maps of a competitive environment. And once you've got one of these things, it's really quite simple. Uh, the stuff on the right-hand side is the stuff you outsource, stuff in the middle lean, stuff on the left, agile in-house techniques and so that's that's what he did so what we're doing now is using multiple techniques which are appropriate to a specific context now normally what we do in government has been this we don't actually understand the landscape we don't understand the environment we've got a one-size-fits-all method uh, either agile everything or six sigma everything or we outsource everything uh, so without the map, you know, we outsource the whole lot, we write it in the specification because we want to know what's being delivered. 
And before you've even started, I can guarantee you the stuff on the right hand side will be efficiently delivered and the stuff on the left hand side will incur excessive change control costs because you can't define it. And you'll get into a fight with a vendor and the vendor will say, well, it's not our fault, the costs have spiraled, it's your fault. And the problem is always that you didn't know what you really wanted. Uh, worst case examples, uh, somebody on your side will go, well, next time we need to specify it better, total disaster, you know, because you can never do that. The issue is the use of appropriate methods. Now, this is where we get into social practice theory a little bit. If I take a, a meaning of a thing and I put teleportation at the top, um, what you've got is teleportation. Uh, first of all, we've got to create it, the thing, invent it, and then it will evolve and become eventually some sort of product and eventually evolve and become more you know, utility, commodity and everywhere, we hope. Right, so what you've got is a common thing, uh, meaning as in teleportation, and three material instances of the same thing. It doesn't matter whether it's compute, whether it's money, penicillin, still the same. Now, when it comes to project management, and that's a common meaning as well, uh, what you've got are three different competencies, uh, Agile, Lean, Six Sigma, and each of them have evolved from novel, emerging, good to becoming best practice, for particular material instances. So extreme programming is fantastic for developing the entirely novel and new because it's all about reducing the cost of change. Lean's brilliant in the middle because it's about learning. Uh, Six Sigma is brilliant for the industrialized on the right. Now what happens is because we, well, that's ter too terribly complicated. That's like mapping. Oh God, look at those interfaces, terribly complicated. What we want is the magic one size fits all method. So we take something like extreme programming and then try and combine the practices of Six Sigma into it. You get a lovely monstrous diagram, which doesn't work. And of course, when it doesn't work, we tell people you use the wrong bits of the process. Okay, so at that point, Agile, which was about people over process, suddenly becomes process over people. And it's become a cult at that point. And we do the same with Six Sigma. So you have Six Sigma and then people, oh, we want to do novel and new. So we're going to import some of the practices. You cannot create a one size fits all. I mean, the only sensible things you can do are really learn, number one, use appropriate methods. It's a bit of a shock at that one. Uh, number two, think small as in break down things into components. Uh, number three, understand the details. It's a really good idea when you're building something of any scale to actually understand what it is you're building. Uh, number four, challenge assumptions. Uh, the number of times people custom build stuff, which is a commodity is just, yeah, it's all over the place. Uh, and, and the last one in that is like focus on user needs. Now these are basic principles, there's about 40 of them. They're really simple things to do. Um, but the problem is without these, without an understanding of the landscape, we all dive into our loving one size fits all methods. And so I totally agree, Agile, it's become a cult. Um, it, it, it's almost like the let's Spotify ourselves and all the rest of it. It's horrendous. And we're so far off the subject now. Um, let me have a look. Did that all make sense, by the way? Can you hear me okay? Total silence. Jamie, any response? You know, we're, here, we're here, Simon. We can all hear you. It made sense to me. Uh, and, and I can see from the chat that everybody's still here. Uh, so you're good. Oh, so I haven't scared you all off yet. So let me see. I've got 23 minutes. Let's see if we can get rid of you all. DevOps, the new legacy. Okay, so I'm going to start off with uh, just a statement. First of all, it's never the novel and new which changed the world, uh, changes the world. So it's not the invention of electricity which radically changed the world. It's when Tesla and Westinghouse turned electricity into, from something exciting into something unbelievably boring, a utility. It's the provision of things as a utility or commodity which changes everything. And in fact, that goes on throughout history. Every single major revolution or change we have had are all associated with points of industrialization. So, you know, the industrial revolution, you've got things like the screw cutting lathe. We took the humble nut and bolt, which was like custom built for everything, into a highly standardized component. It's always that process of industrialization changes the world. And you've all experienced it recently with Amazon. 
uh, where they took computing, a world where we used to have cathedrals called data centers and towers of servers, which we would lovingly name, and they, they, they turned it, made it so boring, we, we've even stopped bothering to name individual servers. Um, so, so it's all become a utility. All right, so that's my premise. Um, I'm going to start with maps. I'm going to explain the history of computing. I'm going to go through container and serverless, and then I'm going to tell you a couple of problems to do with timing, money, and choice. So very quickly, maps. Uh, if you haven't seen my maps before, there's online courses, but maps are really important for understanding landscapes and for competition. So this is the Battle of Thermopylae. I mean, where you've got the basically ancient Greeks fighting against the Persians. The maps are how we communicate about a space and learn how to play the game. And they work because they have three characteristics. They have an anchor, position and movement. Anchor, magnetic north, position of pieces, Athens is here, movement, consistency of movement, north is north, south is south, okay? That gives what we call space meaning. So if I mean, move any of these components around, like Thebes, if I move it somewhere else, it changes the map. Now, in business, we don't have maps. We have loads of things called maps. Uh, business process maps, mind maps, custom journey maps, systems maps. They've all got one thing in common. They're not maps. So systems map, very simple. How do you tell? Uh, here's a systems map. I've highlighted CRM. I've moved the box. Does it change the map? And the answer is no. And that's because it's not a map. It's a graph. And in fact, most things we have are graphs. Uh, so they have like three nodes and connections between them. Uh, the three at the top are identical. Three maps at the bottom are completely different because in those maps, space has meaning. If you want to understand a competitive landscape, you're going to need a map, uh, which means space needs meaning. Okay, so here's a very simple example of a map just to show you the concept. Uh, business is a tea shop, so business wants to sell cups of tea. Public likes to drink cups of tea. Uh, so what you've got, two anchors at the top, business and public. You've got a chain of needs, uh, and that gives position. So this needs this, needs this, needs this. And it's also measured over evolution, which is the axis at the bottom. And that gives movement. So once you've got a map of space, you can simply start challenging things rather easily. So for a very simple example, here's a business process flow diagram, insurance company. It's a common example I use, but for those who've not seen it, they need to compute, order server, server goes into goods in, modify mountain bracket. There's the process flow. They've got a bottleneck to do with modification of servers. They'd spent six months trying to solve this bottleneck, come up with the idea of spending millions on robotics, just about to spend the money. Now you can't go in there and challenge their narrative, their idea, because you know, storytellers are embedded to narrative, it will become highly political. So I got them to map, 15 minutes of mapping. There you are, user needs compute, compute order server, server, compute needs rack, mount, modify. Very simple now, I don't tell them they're wrong, I just look at the map and say, I think there's something wrong with the map. I said, why have you got racks in custom built? The answer was they had custom built racks, so what are modifications you're doing to servers? The servers we buy don't fit our racks, so we have to take cases off, drill new holes, add new plates. That's why we need robotics. And at that point, the penny drops because somebody goes, hang on, why don't we use standard racks? Most organizations trapped by context, are trapped by their environment, can't see it. This is not because they're stupid. This is literally because they are trapped by context. Right, entire history of computing. So here we go in about six minutes. That's where we started. Uh, well, we actually, we started before that, the things like the Z3, uh, which was 1943. But we started in a world where user wanted some sort of application, with users very rare, and it was actually built in the physical hardware. Plugs, great fun. Uh, but everything evolves. That's one of the patterns you discover, supply and demand competition, everything evolves, moves left to right. So we ended up with things like this, Leo, Lions Electronic Office. Okay, and so now what we got is users had an application. We had this idea called an operating system. And there you are, still custom built compute and everything evolves. And eventually we end up with this, the IBM 650. Oh, I love this machine. Okay, so now what we've got is users application operating system on compute as a product. Um, it had a characteristic high MTTR, high mean time to recovery. So we started building novel architectural practices. And those practices were things like, I don't know, disaster recovery tests, scale up, things like that. And they evolved. 
And so what happened is a new faction formed around those good architectural practices. We'd go and say to people, have you done your capacity planning? What's your disaster recovery? How are you going to cope with these components failing? It became the good architect. We wrote books on this stuff. Anyway, everything evolved uh, and we got so started to get language frameworks. So we got runtimes and emerging coding practice and that evolved. So user application, emerging coding practice, runtime operating system, good architectural practice for computers a product. And that evolved and uh, ended up somewhere like here. And we spent our time improving the process flow, making things more efficient, etc. It was all wonderful. And then something dreadful happened. And that dreadful thing was this cloud evil. So all that it means is computers a product went from computers a product to computers a utility. Now that causes co-evolution. So suddenly we got a new novel architectural practice because we've gone from high MTTR to low MTTR, low mean time to recovery. So not weeks and months waiting for a machine, but seconds. So now we distribute systems, design for failure, chaos engine, all those good words suddenly become possible. Uh, but also we created new systems, so new value. So that's another thing that happens as things evolve, you get those new systems. So we've got things like Netflix. All right, whenever you see a shift of things from product to more commodity, you get an explosion of new things. That's a common pattern and you see that throughout history. So all of these major revolutions where we saw all this wonderful change, all starts with industrialization. So the two are connected. The second thing is as things change, product to more commodity, you get these new novel architectural practices. And that we see throughout history. And that's normally described by uh, organizations. So every time we've gone through this, industrial revolution, we've got the American system of engineering, age of electricity, we've got scientific management, Taylorism, hierarchy of offices. Every time we, we go through, then we get a new form of organization with new set of practices. So back in 2011, knowing this, I'm a population geneticist. Uh, that's my background in genetics. I was able to do a study on companies. And sure enough, uh, 2011, you've got a phenotypic change, a difference in the type of companies. It's a very much traditional departmental next generation service cell based. And, you know, if you just go down the list, Big data used, resilience M plus one, failure testing, disaster recovery, you know, M plus one disaster recovery, scale up, single methods. That's all that sort of uh, high MTTR mindset. And next generation was all designed for failure, chaos engine, scale out, all that sort of good. Now, it doesn't mean that all the past best practices like the ITIL stuff was thrown out of the window. It's just the new faction, uh, often co-opted, but developed a set of practices around these change characteristics. Okay, but nonetheless, we had CEOs go and make my stuff cloudy, um, and people would just go and take uh, their entire infrastructure and stick it on cloud, and Amazon would have an outage, and they'd go, oh, you know, uh, end of cloud is night, doesn't work. Uh, to which you would go, shouldn't that architecture evolve as well? To which people, you know, would respond, you know, burn him, blah de blah uh, they didn't like it. And the reason for this, very simple, is because of inertia. We all have inertia, even in the scientific community, but in, in the world of computing, the inertia came from best architectural practice for use of computers as a product, and also our entire estates, physical assets, so our data centers. All those with lots of data centers, lots of computers, who had best architectural practice, had inertia to the change. Novel architectural practice eventually got a name. We did call it DevOps. Uh, so it started in 2008. It actually started way before then, well, a bit, a bit of time before then. 2008, we gave the name DevOps. Uh, and so the new faction appears. And the new faction, we run around saying things like, you know, it's all about user needs, iterative cycles, automation, collaboration. And somebody would go, but so was I till. And we would go, burn him, heretic, that sort of thing, because it's all factional. All right. So then the operating system evolved, became much more of a commodity. Now the runtime is doing exactly the same. So it's shifting from basically product to more utility, hence we get AWS Lambda. We're seeing explosion of new emerging practice and new things being built. It's all the same basic repeating pattern. Now, when people say new practices, People often ask what practices, lots, different security models, we're looking further up the stack in terms of conversational programming, different ways of architecting, there's difference between the serverless platform and the serverless architecture, but one of my favourite, and probably the most profound one as I can see, is the importance of money. 
so if I map out a, uh, uh, an application for hailing a cab, um, one of the beauties about serverless, because these actually are diagrams, uh, oh, sorry, maps of capital, is we have billing per function. So all of a sudden, we can start to monitor capital flow in our application. And that makes huge changes, because suddenly refactoring has financial value. Never used to. Uh, it was always guesswork, but now you can directly measure it and so forth. So, so it changes our investment, our monitoring, observability of capital flow. It's slowly growing, um, but it's an important area. All right. So then we get into container versus serverless, which is one of my favorite debates. Um, that a new emerging practice is creating a new community, a new faction, which has its uh, own flag. Now, uh, as with past factions, uh, they always create a new flag. They always distance themselves from the past. So in the same way, DevOps went ITIL, oh, we're nothing to do with you, but still copied a lot of ITIL principles. And uh, you're seeing this community going, DevOps, we're different from you. Of course, there's always attempts to say, oh, you're just part of DevOps. In the same way that ITIL, there was always attempts to say, DevOps is just part of ITIL. Um, generally, factions don't work out so, so, so cozy. They normally split. And so we see this, we see this sort of argument going on, you know, two tribes regarded each other suspiciously. This is Forrest Brazil's cartoon, which I love, uh, the serverless and container groups. And here's the fundamental problem, what's happening. If I look at this map and I look at this line from emerging architectural practice serverless to operating system to good architectural practice to cloud, well, that's the future. You know, the, the, the serverless emerging architectural practice. That's where the focus needs to be, where your shift needs to be. And, and the reality is everything underneath that line, I'm afraid, is just going to become invisible. I mean, we're desperately trying to get down into the weeds and worrying about things like orchestration of containers and all the rest of it. I, I sort of understand because that's what we've come from and that's our past. But you know, simply from the point of view of speed, efficiency, and competition, we have to move up the stack. Um, you know, the temptation to remain is always strong. But unfortunately, the best coding practice for the product as a runtime, LAMP.NET stack, that stuff is changing, and those underlying components are disappearing. So I often talk about, therefore, DevOps is the new legacy, which is another way of getting people to say, burn him heretic at conferences I go to. So now we get to timing, money, and choice. Because people then say to me, oh, this will never happen, or take 30, 40 years, or, you know, um, uh, oh, well, serverless, it, 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 it's, it's not going to work because uh, it doesn't save me money, cloud never saved me money, or, or people, some, some people think they have a choice in this. Well, first of all, these transitions take about 10 to 15 years historically. So if you say server, and that's just to become the new norm. Uh, the laggards take a lot, lot longer. So when you think about the evolution of something, uh, every single evolution is made up of thousands of uh, what are called diffusion curves. And every time we get a new, more evolved component, it has to diffuse in society. So normally it takes about 10 to 15 years to become the new norm. So for serverless, if you're talking 2014, you're talking 2024 to 2029 is when it will start becoming the new norm. And then you've got to add at least another 25 years for the laggards. There's always, you know, the laggards today are doing digital transformation, which is basically saying we've discovered there's something called the internet. But uh, it's always a, a long, long way behind. Okay, so the next problem is money. Um, and this goes back to something which we, is called Jevons paradox, the cold question. Um, the problem is very simple. Uh, because of that efficiency and speed, we build lots of new stuff. Uh, and as a result, we consume more of the underlying framework. As a result, we actually never save any money. It's the same with cloud. Everybody was like, cloud is going to uh, massively reduce our IT budgets. What happens is we don't because we're in competition with each other. What, we just end up doing more stuff. It's a bit of a nightmare if you haven't done the transformation because the, you, you know, in order just to keep up, you have to spend more and more and more just to keep up. But uh, uh, which leads to the, the third thing is choice. Uh, whenever you're competing against others, if somebody adapts, they go, gain those benefits of efficiency, speed, and, and access to new sources of value. Now, that creates pressure on everybody else to adapt. And as more adapt, uh, the pressure becomes overwhelming. 
so basically you never have a choice about evolution, uh, which is why we don't have a world where we live, you know, uh, uh, where people have custom built everything. Uh, and large amounts of components that we depend upon are highly industrialized, highly commodity in order for us to build higher order systems. And, and then my favorite example of that is the uh, toaster project, Thomas Thwaite, well worth reading, uh, tried to build a toaster from scratch. Uh, basically has 120 components, all highly industrialized, cost the toaster cost about 25 uh, pounds built it from scratch tried to use the raw materials to build the component spent a year spent about nine thousand pounds uh, when he, it didn't look like a toaster it looked like a blob of plastic uh, the first time he put it switched it on it burst into flames and that was it um, our entire systems all depend on industrialized components which is why you see them it's also why you have no choice and that is what's called the red queen effect uh, very simple so basically just a very quick introduction into maps, just a quick history of computing. It's perfectly normal for, as things evolve, to see new practices appear and get new factions to appear. Now those factions, it's like, uh, it's like your parent and child. It's like my boy, uh, he's saying, dad, yeah, I'm nothing like you. Yeah, okay, you inherit quite a few things from me, but in his world, nothing. So it's the same with factions. What happens is the DevOps, we're nothing like the ITIL, still we inherit from them. The serverless faction is, oh, we're not the same as the DevOps, yeah, but we'll inherit. But we, we, we don't do this evolution gracefully. Uh, we, it's all a you know, bit of flag waving factional stuff. Uh, and the big one at the moment is the container versus serverless, which is fundamentally a debate of some people accepting that the runtime is shifting from a product to a utility and a whole bunch of people getting into the weeds down below, uh, usually for reasons of interoperability, uh, portability, oh, it's really critically important uh, that we can move from this to that and all the rest of it as well. Um, those arguments are often given. So homing money and choice, we always mess up on that. Um, 10 to 15 years to become the new norm. Uh, the niches and everything else will go on for a much longer time. You're talking 25 years for the lag, to add on another 25 years just for the laggards. Uh, money, it won't save us any money, never does, because we just do more stuff. And choice, you have none. Simple as that. Uh, so that's my argument why DevOps is the new legacy. Uh, it was great. And if you wanted to be doing DevOps, you should have been 2010. Uh, that was 10 years ago. If you're starting DevOps projects now uh, and doing cloud infrastructure now, by the time you get it up and running seven years from now, you will have created the new legacy. No point. You may as well just hold off for a couple of years, watch how serverless grows, and then get into the serverless space. Right. Very good, Simon. Round of applause. Brother. <laughs> And give you four minutes left to, to have questions. <laughs> uh, we, we're very sorry that we, we got interrupted at the beginning because we were a little bit late and then we had a gentleman on the sales Oh, call. don't apologise. It's perfectly fine. That's all right. That's all right. But, but the audience, are, are right. Questions. Who's got a question? Uh, by the way, I'm getting a lot of abuse in the chat box about container solutions being legacy. Yeah, you Thank need you. to change your name. Thank you. We know. We know. Totally to, agree. <laughs> for, the record, for the record, if somebody comes in with a custom developer request or something brand new, we recommend serverless. Why, why, do, why didn't you call it legacy container solutions? <laughs> because I couldn't see the future. <laughs> uh, there's someone uh, that uh, the, the mic doesn't work, but Mark left a question in the, in the chat. It's a very long one. Okay, I can ask that. So Simon, in the chat, serverless and per invocation billing is attractive for intermittent workloads. Websites, API calls, right. When you've got continuing load or high throughput systems, performance gets in the way. Serverless becomes too expensive. Yeah, now it becomes too expensive. What's your take on that, Simon? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's no different from EC2 in the early stages, 2006, 2007, 2008. Lots of reasons and arguments given about how people could, you know, run their own environments more efficiently and so forth. I mean, I look at somebody like iRobot, 23 million robots in the wild, uh, which is all those rumba, uh, those vacuum cleaners, uh, communicating with each other. I think their entire IT spend is about $15,000 a month. Um, so most organizations haven't got a hope in hell of getting near those sorts of figures. So um, I, I, yeah, I understand these cases and it's going to be on a case by case basis, isn't it? Um, it depends on the environment because your serverless architecture is more than just the serverless platform. Uh, the serverless architecture is your code, it's the platform, it's the services you consume and provide. So, um, you, you know, there will be things it's not suited to at the moment. There will be examples of that and that's perfectly normal. 
Yeah, at the moment. I mean, if you look at electricity, start, we start commoditizing that a couple of hundred years ago. And now with solar and battery and wind, the cost per gigawatt is, is, is trending downwards. You can only think that's going to happen with serverless in the next two years. So it might well, not be the right time now. Um, yeah, I, I, so the, one of the issues that you get, and it's the same issue with, uh, we have with uh, a cloud. Is, is back in 2008, 2000, well, actually, no, even in 2011, uh, a lot of big consultancies were writing reports about how cloud was just for startups. Now, this is 2011. No proper enterprise would use it and all the rest of it. So about 2015, people started going, in, well, hang on a minute. I mean, uh, you know, Netflix is a proper enterprise uh, <laughs> and, and uh, they've just announced they've got rid of all our data centers. And of course, by the time that people start to realize they can do this stuff, and people have found those new patterns and the systems have changed. They all then rush out to try and get the skills and it becomes prohib prohibitively expensive uh, to find the skills at that, at that sort of point. Well, so, 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 so this was the strategic magic trick of ING Bank in the Netherlands. You can mm -hmm. you'd call them a, a, a dinosaur, call them what you like, but, but everybody saw what was happening. Like, what if Amazon gets a banking license? Everybody knew what was happening in DevOps. ING were the only big company we came across who had the courage to act on that insight. And everybody else just waited. And now 10 years later, everybody wants Kubernetes developers, mobile developers. In, in, for example, in Amsterdam, where are they? They all work at ING. They're not going to come and work on your legacy, legacy shit. And so, in my opinion, the idea of we couldn't build container solutions today from scratch. Okay. So, so, five years ago, when, people, when this, was, this was weird and niche. So you prepare. Go ahead, Simon. No, no, no. I, I, I think there's several good points there. I, I just want to come back on. One, uh, in terms of most executives have little or no understanding of their landscape. It's a bit like that insurance company. We're going to get some robotics, digital transformation, blah, blah, blah. Actually, you need standard racks. Not because they're daft, it's because they have no situational awareness. That, that's that's uh, problem number one. Problem number two, uh, you talk about Kubernetes. I've got to say, if you're behind the game now, and you're going, oh, we better start our DevOps journey in cloud and blah, and we better get some Kubernetes. Stop, stop. Uh, don't do that. Wait a couple of years, go to serverless. Because uh, it's often, you know, that sort of stuff which people are building now will become their future legacy. So don't pile in late to build the future legacy. You may as well take a bullet and, 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 and move further up the stack. Um, and the third problem is because executives um, often don't understand the landscape and they're quite busy people or think they're busy people, there is a marriage of convenience with these consultants who come along uh, and basically, you know, so you think. Uh, I, I mean, I'd really love executives to think more about the space they have, but uh, um, not always right, the case. Here's a question. Here's Sorry. A question. Uh, do you see any companies anticipating the serverless evolution as cloud providers might have done before? Uh, well, so I, uh, I'm sorry about this. I built the world's first ever serverless environment, which was in 2006, which was known as Zimki. And so that was JavaScript front and back end, build entire applications in JavaScript with billing per function and a whole range of services, etc. And it was growing like hotcakes. And then basically uh, Amazon launched EC2 in 2006. And so by the early part of 2007, we'd installed Zimkia running across uh, Amazon. And then I think it was 2008, Google came out with Google App Engine. Uh, which they go around and say, we were first, no, you weren't, mate. And actually some of their developers came and saw our stuff at Zimki. I know them. Um, so so uh, the problem so, was, the problem was, is the parent company had one of those big consultancies come in and the three things that we were doing, which was this uh, serverless, basically cloud environment, platform, JavaScript, uh, 3D printing was the other thing we were doing, the use of mobile phones as cameras. Apparently that was not the future. The future was 3D TV. So we should shut down all that other stuff and spend about a billion billion dollars on 3D TV. This is why I don't like big American consultancy firms because I think they're mostly, uh, anyway. Um, so uh, uh, that's when I went to Ubuntu and we took Ubuntu from 3% of the operating system market to 70% the cloud just by using maps. It's great fun. So people knew this stuff, but you've also got to get the timing right. And if things aren't ready to move, you can go too early. And Sun did this with compute utility. It was too early. And then Amazon hit it about the right time. Amazon like the Chinese government, are very good at finding the right time to industrialize and invest in, in that space. I think that's a question about would, set, would people anticipate serverless? I don't think you'll make as much money with serverless as you will with a cloud platform. So you have to work out who's going to change serverless into a racket. 
because I think as a business, I'm trying to work out who, who benefits. I mean, surely, surely the cloud providers make all of their money selling virtual machines. And so oh. I think you might anticipate it as a user. So, so new banks, upcoming banks might say, let's, let's be born in the serverless, born in serverless. But the providers of the, the functions, is that oh, what, uh, okay. people money? Oh, well, that's interesting. If you write the, the function which everybody else uses, uh, the basic, I don't know, user register or some function which everybody uses, you're going to make a fortune, even if it's a small little bit of it at a time for that No, function. you won't. You won't because someone will clone it. You oh, well, oh well, that's the interesting thing. Then we'll, get, then we'll get app markets and then we'll get people cloning and then we'll get people having our service runs better your, for your function than anybody else's. So you'll get that competitive market. Now, if you are the platform, the beauty about this is you can mine all that metadata to spot the future patterns because when we write code, at least 90% of all the code I've ever written has been written by somebody else at some other point. I mean, you just ask people the simple question, when you write an application, uh, when you look at what you're building, has anybody ever written this before? And the answer is yes, pretty much all the time. So um, that is the problem they're tackling. Um, there will be the potential for people to work, but build entire companies on well-functioning functions. Well, that will happen. Uh, and if it's a very large, effects and a large number of users cases there'll be money to be made but will the platforms ultimately make the most of course they will. right i'm going to try one more time to see if anybody wants to ask a question rather than type it see if we can bring anybody into the discussion yeah. are there any more questions or things we didn't touch or it, does anybody would anybody like to say something anything <laughs> i'd like to ask a question if that's possible Absolutely, yeah, shoot. Okay, well, uh, Jamin and, uh, Jamie and Simon, thanks. First, uh, good talks. It both resonated quite well with me. Um, I actually have a question about the, the quick checklist uh, used as a defense against these dark arts. Uh, Jamie, you, you said it quite well. It really needs you to also be aware of your ego, be in control of your ego. Yeah. Um, in the more, let's say, traditional IT companies or non-IT companies, let's say the, the non-ING banks in this case, the decision makers often are people that don't have the knowledge, uh, but they do have the ego. Um, and how do you handle that as a consulting company? Like, how do you make sure that these executives that also pay your bill get their ego in check? Uh, this is a difficult one. So I think the answer to that question would be three ways. So we talk about this. I would talk, let's say I was in a meeting with some executives and then maybe in a one-on-one, -on -one, I would talk about how, you know, look, it can be difficult. You've been, if you work in a psychologically unsafe environment, a lot of people act as if they've got weak egos because they're, they're, uh, they are, they're macho, they, they don't show weakness. But actually, if you speak to them, then they might have a good ego, but the context drives that behavior. But the other thing is I would be open and say, hey, I know it's difficult. You've been the cock of the walk for the last 25 years. You've, you've worked your way up this, but what has gotten you here won't get you any further. So we discuss this. Um, sometimes our advice is completely thrown out. You know, they want a quick solution. We can't provide it. And then we're like, fuck, guys, you called us, right? Um, so it's difficult, but stepwise, with compassion, there cannot be passion without compassion. And fat white men in their 50s are humans too. And we need to remember that. Um, so and that, that was a joke. But not all men in their 50s are fat. Um, so a lot of executives, you know, male from a different generation. So compassion, uh, openness. In our book, we tell a story. So we, tr we hope it's relatable about a middle manager called Jenny. Um, but yes, it's certainly difficult. And one of the key patterns in the book, actually, there has to be an existential threat. Now, Simon would call this a forcing function because mm -hmm. all of a sudden the most mature people with the biggest egos, if you put a gun to their head, they'll start behaving. And the existential threat is the only pattern we've seen in every single cloud native transformation. Okay, I'm going to throw something else in there. I think the biggest problem uh, that I come across in terms of egos is stories. Uh, and the problem is, is that we spend an awful lot of time telling people that to be a good leader, you've got to be a good storyteller. So when somebody gives you a story, like the ro uh, insurance company and its digital robots and everything else, if you are challenging the story, you are challenging the storyteller directly, which makes it highly political, you get into a fight and all the rest of it. One of the reasons why I get them to put it down on a map 
is that I can challenge the map without challenging the person. And in fact, you can get them to challenge the map. So it, it really, executives, a lot of them feel like we're fake CEOs and all the rest of it as well. I used to be a CEO. I used to be feel like I was a fake CEO. That's normal uh, because people don't know. Um, a lot of it is about stories and narrative. Stories are the biggest problem. Uh, if you can get them to put it down on a map, you can then start to challenge the map. And that's when you get discussion, or I found you can get discussion going. Really difficult if you're going to do by narrative alone. Right, so Matthias, I'm going to put in a blog into the chat box. This was the notes for our last webinar. And the, the webinar that Simon and I did was about virtual worlds. So basically most decisions are made in between the ears. You imagine a decision and its imaginary consequences. We whiteboard a lot at Consumer Solutions, which removes the focus from the, sub, the, the, the subject, the person, to the object. Wardley maps do the same. So I'll drop that in there now, but this is certainly a tip. Take the person out of the equation. And the truth is that a lot of these executives are not used to strategy formulation. And that's, strategy formulation is about being wrong, uncertainty, and moving stepwise. So you're asking them to do something they've probably never, never done in their, you know, their careers to that point. I'll drop that in now. Go, Simon. Shoot. I was going to say it's even worse because, um, you know, I, yeah, I do a list of uh, about 40 common doctrine, i.e. principles which are universally useful. One is have a common language. Number two is have challenge assumptions. So one of the things you can do with a map is you can challenge people's assumptions, like why are we treating this way? Why, uh, why haven't we got this component? A lot of executives are not comfortable in a world where other people can challenge. When they talk about challenging assumptions, our company, we like to challenge assumptions. What that really means is I'm gonna give you orders and then challenge why you haven't done them. Not, not a two way street. Um, so, you know, um, but often, unfortunately, it's the people actually doing the work who know the problems with the thing. You, you often get projects which people know are a disaster before it's even started. But no one can challenge the narrative because that would mean challenging the storyteller. And there isn't a mechanism or it's not a comfortable environment to challenge assumptions itself, which is also why I like to use not only maps, but pre-mortem, post-mortem. Uh, I find that an effective way and blameless, effective way uh, of doing projects. There are so many good questions. Somebody said, uh, are um, uh, basically home-built serverless platforms uh, uh, a cult? Um, I, uh, well, I take the view of there will be lots of people giving reasons why it's a really good idea to build your own homegrown serverless platform, uh, a bit like OpenStack. Um, the, yeah, fine. Um, I, I'm sure there's lots of vendors who will make money from that. Uh, and there will be some niches for a short time. Right, so just let me loop back to you, Matthias. Does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely did. Thanks. Some good pointers. Uh, yeah, so certainly ego is... Uh, I, read a, I read a really good book, and my next webinar will be about this, about incompetent leaders. And basically, <laughs> emotionally immature leaders are the ones who make decisions that make themselves look good, but that might be terrible for the group. Um, I'll really go into that in depth. I've shared the links. I would say this. If you work for a company with weak leadership... How long are you going to headbutt that wall for, right, before you walk? Because life's too short and there's some brilliant people out there doing some brilliant work. And certainly we will help with as much compassion as we can muster everybody. But at some point, if a person doesn't want to do something, yeah, that's, that's their choice. And, uh, uh, you know, companies do say, yeah, we want this cloud native business, but it requires a change, a personal change. And only from the personal change, the technologically, technological change follows People are not wanting to change. You, the, the company reflects. Don't forget, as a very good heuristic, the mental health of your company reflects the mental health of your executive team. So if you've got clunky legacy processes, yeah, you might have a, a set of leaders who think in a very clunky and legacy way. Um, so cloud native is a reflection of the emotional maturity. So speak to Cockroft, Chaos Engineering, VMs, all that cool shit they do. Then speak to the people and you'll see these are mature people, egos in check, who are comfortable with failure. That awesome company follows that mindset, not the other way around. That, that being said, the day of these so-called leaders is, is over. There's a new generation uh, of completely different people who, who, who my generation now run these companies. Uh, you're hopeful. <laughs> you're hopeful. I'm not saying that. 
<laughs> I see a few examples, maybe. I mean, um, but um, we shall see. Uh, one of the you see one of the reasons for this. Uh, um, I, I talk about those forty basic principles of doctrine. These are universally useful principles. So there's about thirty economic patterns useful for anticipation. Over a hundred different forms of gameplay that are useful for manipulating a space. And there's about forty universal useful principles. Things like you know common language, challenge assumptions, use appropriate methods, uh, focus on user needs, understand the details. I mean they're really really boring stuff. Now. A lot of companies are rubbish at the lot, but it's okay to be hopeless at the lot as long as all your competitors are. So if you're in a bank, it's totally fine to not understand your users, the user needs, uh, not to challenge assumptions, not to use appropriate methods, because all the other banks are just the same. Uh, I mean, we talk about government being bad. I mean, the worst examples of duplication I found in government is 120, well, it was 118 workflow systems. Uh, doing the same thing. So we built prisoner registration 118 different ways, one for every prison basically. Um, but in, in the banking world, I've got a bank which has built risk management over a thousand times. We don't know how much over a thousand times, we stopped counting. Uh, so the level of duplication and waste that goes on in the corporate sector can be vastly higher, but it's okay, they're all right, because they're, everybody else is uh, equally um, um, <laughs> dysfunctional and competition is against relative to others so it's okay to be hopeless as long as everybody else a couple of follow-up questions oh we've got a young 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 person joining us hello young person <laughs> no you're on what say hello no <laughs> um, okay we've got a, another question where can we learn more about these common economic patterns please simon Oh, well, uh, all of my stuff is Creative Commons to so help yourself. If you just go medium.com forward slash Wardley Maps, there's uh, 19 chapters of a book there. It's all free. Help yourself. Take it away. Um, there's an entire mapping community online. If you go list.wardleymaps.com, uh, you'll find an awesome list. Uh, which is maintained by the community, which is people doing videos, training, uh, all that sort of stuff. And there's lists of the doctrines and patterns on there as well. well Just to help yourself. So Dave has come in and said per persuasion can work with big egos. This is true. This is true. You can persuade someone with a big ego, but it's not sustainable. <laughs> it's what I found. So you can, in the early days of CS, we won some big deals. But if, the, if you had to do too much convincing, when the rubber hit the road three or six months later, bang, you'd, you'd ground to a halt. Yeah. Now, now, have we overrun by any chance? We have miles overrun, but people are still here. <laughs> oh, well, I'm, ha I'm happy to carry on. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that people were very uh, engaged, so they, they, they stayed with us. But oh, that's very kind. Thank you for, uh, for your patience as well. Right. Any more questions? Anybody else want to grab the mic? Uh, anything specific? Any, what should we do next time? Is there anything we need to go into more depth on the next time we meet? Any subject we want to tackle? Are, are we are we lining ourselves up to do another one here? Happy with me? You 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 bring if you bring the audience, mate. So I'm happy. No. With <laughs> <laughs> I was thought I thought it was you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't say that. I'm just a very ordinary person. Well, so what I'm doing, you can guess on the new one if you like. I'm doing a but the next talk. I'm really excited about this. I'm doing mini biopics on Lincoln, Churchill, and Attlee. And I'm trying oh, to wow. yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to talk about those crucible experiences in their in their formative years and how they were primed to lead in their uh, when, when the moment came. There's there's patterns for transformation and, and cloud native within mm. that. But I I is very excited. It's a bit of a selfish webinar. I'm very oh, excited. Oh, that sounds exciting. I, yeah, I might want to just come along and listen and throw questions at you. I'd, I'd a, that, yeah. yeah, that's a definitely, definitely, definitely good one. Definitely good one. Uh, da, 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 da. Mm. Right. I think if there's nothing else, I reckon we should wrap up. What do you think, Simon? Sounds good to me. I yeah. mean, uh, I, I've enjoyed it. It's been... Uh, uh, interesting as always. Um, I, I loved your examples of rituals and symbols because one of the things I do is not just map uh, systems and because you can map against activities, pra practices, data and knowledge. I also map ethical values and map culture itself uh, as well as political systems and other bits and pieces. So I love the examples of the rituals and symbols being copied. I thought it was really interesting. Uh, so much so I'm going to have to just pinch them. <laughs> 
that's why, that's why, I mean that 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 sort of study in smaller cultures or uh, it's really interesting like there's a yeah. part there's a part on the northern coast of australia where the people are genetically papuan you know they're in they're, they're descendants of papuan but their language is, is polynesian so the the language spread more easily than the people actually did because for whatever reason it was it was lexically easier to parse easier to spread i found all of that stuff hugely fascinating and james cook was a yorkshireman right so if he, yeah. did, he studied the Pacific Islands, then it's good enough for me. Mm. Yeah. And I was going to say, uh, make a recommendation. If you're going to do explore this whole sort of uh, DevOps engineering serverless type space, there's lots of really good speakers out there. Uh, one of my favorite uh, is uh, Kat Sweetall. If you don't know Kat, uh, I will have to make an introduction. She's fantastic. And if you're going to go into the whole sort of like um, a culture, power, that sort of stuff, it, it's, it's worth also exploring out the gaming world. Um, so Andy uh, Nordgren is, uh, used to be a development manager for EVE Online. She's fantastic at this stuff as well. So uh, if you ever want introductions, more than happy to do that as well. Very good. Beautiful, Simon. Okay. Pleasure. We are both, Simon and I and Carla, thank you to Carla, the, the organizational firepower behind this. Thank you to Simon for an amazingly uh, informative and stimulating talk. Thank you all for coming in. All the, and I can see a few of my friends from the Agile com community here. Thank you for the input on Twitter. Thank you, Willem, for reminding me of the day of Spa because I thought it was 2002. <laughs> I, was, I was out by about five years. <laughs> yeah, I've been going through my old blog posts to find, yeah. to find that out. Yeah. Um, I wrote about the chasm a lot around 2004. <laughs> I was wondering if the if the model was right, because all models are wrong, but some are useful. This chasm model seems to be quite useful. Yeah. Oh, do you mean Jeffrey Moore's uh, crossing yes. the chasm? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's um, uh, Everett Rogers' diffusion curve. So the original work is Everett Rogers, wow. that's the diffusion. Uh, Jeffrey takes the non-cumulative form and he added that chasm to it, uh, the jump. And, and diffusion curves are really interesting, except for I, I, my focus is on the evolution of things. And the single evolution, and the evolution of a single item will go through hundreds, if not thousands, of diffusion curves. So there's hundreds, if not yes. thousands, of chasms. Like the, the, the computing, there wasn't one chasm, there was hundreds of them. So it's really interesting stuff by Jeffrey Well, I do like that. I mean, uh, my, my, my focus, however, is more on the evolution side. Right. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, minutes next time. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. See us on Twitter. Ideas, suggestions. We're very fluid. This is a community thing. We want the conversation to be multiple places. Uh, I love you all. Thank you again, Carla. Thank you, Simon. Thank Pleasure. you. Pleasure. See you later. Take Bye. care. Bye. Bye.